Cliff started by referencing lots of books and lots of writers. I'm going to reference a few. I'm going to start by mentioning Linda Rising. How many of you have heard of Linda Rising? Fearless change, more fearless change. Linda says, if you want successful meetings, presentations, sessions, bring cake. So I brought some chocolates for you, you. to say thank you. I'm not sure that the people at the back will get any. But this is not to say thank you for me, it's thank you for being here and being who you are. Pleasure. I got caught up in the rain, so I saw Hotel Chocolat, so I hid there until the rain stopped earlier. Right. So, another great woman, another great person even, called Kay Tempest, formerly Kate Tempest, poet, spoken word artist. She said this, well, she said this was the best advice she has ever, she was ever given. When she gets on the stage, shock them into focus with clarity of intent. So what's my intent? At 4.15, no, 3.45 on the second day of a conference. This is what my intent is. I would like to invite you to do more of your work around outcomes so that you get more of what matters. So that's the intent and that's the outcome. The outcome is what you get when you've done what you intended to do. There's that definition probably more correctly later, but why? Why, why should you do more of your work around intent, around outcomes even? <coughs> so we asked the question of our client when we did some work with them recently. Um, we said, why do you get stuck? What constrains your autonomy? And these are some of the answers that they have given us. So it's all about no goals, no transparency. Mike would say it's a bit of a negative way to put it. Can we turn it into something positive? But we need clarity. We need more clarity on the goals and what it is that we would like to accomplish. We like more clarity on the direction. So um, to quote somebody else, a famous American baseball player, he says, if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up someplace else. And the worst thing is you won't know it. So, who am I? This is who I am. The only important thing here is that I'm desperately trying, I've been trying for a few years to be of use rather than to be right. Yeah. And people are catching myself trying to be right. And I welcome you catching me if, if I end up trying to convince you that something is right and your thinking is wrong, then I'm probably not of use. I'm also part of a, uh, I don't know how we refer to ourselves, boutique consultancy, organizational design consultancy called Biliminal. And my colleague Sandra is here with me, thank you, for opening the chocolates. So, that's the why, that's the who, what are the outcomes? So again, few people put some definitions. We started the conference with Gabrielle talking about outcomes. Cliff was talking about outcomes earlier. All of us seem to be talking about out outcomes. So I need a new talk. <laughs> this is what I was trying to say earlier, probably unsuccessfully. It's not what you do. It's what you've got when you've done it. For the old people like me, they may remember Bananarama song, it's not what you do, it's the way that you do it. This is slightly different, okay? Uh, and this is the um, dictionary definition. So it's the result, it's the effect of your actions. And this is my definition of being outcome oriented, not particularly clever. Whatever you're doing, always know who you're doing it for and why, which means what would you like to achieve? So. It's, it's probably going to ring true for you as well. When I talk to organizations, I worked with an insurance company a few years ago, and they were determined to start looking at outcomes and focusing on outcomes. It took them about three years. 
because our desire, our, our kind of urge to get busy, to get those cars on the road that Cliff was sh showing us earlier, to fill all the gaps between the cars, to do stuff, to start stuff, to do activities, or to produce stuff, outputs, in all of that busyness, we forget why we're doing it. Much more useful to think about why are we doing it, what are we trying to achieve. And then the big question, how? How do we, how do we make outcome-oriented change happen? So this is the majority of it, and then I'll finish in a similar way to Cliff. I'm going to be looking at people to some extent. So, how? So at the highest level, these are the principles, the principles of outcome-oriented change. Start with outcomes, start with the end in mind, discover the path through hypothesis and experiment. Again, people say, say three times as, as much as you think it needs to be said, and you'll be one third of the way there. So we typically under-communicate at, at the level of 10 times. So me repeating what previous speakers said probably will work in some sort of way, will be useful, right? So hypothesis experiments, I'm going to be talking a bit more about those. And then continuous reflection based on feedback. And then you learn and adapt and keep going. So that's what I'm going to be talking about. That's the how in a nutshell. So you start with the outcome. What is it that you would like to accomplish? Who are you serving? What are their needs? What are the unmet needs or underserved needs? And then you break it down. So big outcomes into smaller outcomes, maybe into even smaller goals, maybe sprint goals if you're working in two-week iterations. And only then do you get to outputs and activities. Although, Jose challenged me, well, made me think about this when I did the flight level systems architecture the other, the other month. Maybe we shouldn't wait to get to the level of initiatives and activities all the way down at the level of maybe weeks. Maybe we should do that earlier. I need to do some more thinking and doing and trying on that level. But it is all about what it is that you would like to get when you've done what you've done. So some examples of these big outcomes, some people call them missions. Mariana Mazzucato talks about mission-based economy. Second example is from her paper for EU. Okay, you probably have heard of the first one. What do you notice about these things? What, what are a few of the things, a couple of things that jump out at you in both of these? So they're concrete. Yeah. Sorry, you want to say something? No, I was going to say easily measurable. They're measurable. You know when you've got there or not. Frederick, do you want to say something? No, they're big. The big. <laughs> the big, hairy, but you know if you got there, if you succeeded or not. And that's the important thing. Be the best in our industry. How do you know? You know if you got to the moon and got the men saved back to Earth, OK? And it doesn't say how. OK, so then what? So then we do some research. I was talking with Frederick about that earlier. The research starts very early. The research never stops. Experiments are part of the research, but you start with the research earlier. What do we know about the context? What do we know about the things that we want to explore? What are our insights? So you start with insight. So Peter Senge came up with a concept. I think he came up with a concept of tension. So what are the tensions? Where are you now? Where do you want to get to? What is pulling you towards the goal? What is holding you back? What are the tensions? And then you say, well, OK, what options do I have? And again, we heard the talk about range and increasing your number of options. So what are we going to act upon? Which of these tensions are we going to act upon? And then when we decide, we form a hypothesis. And I'm talking as if, so this is simplistic. All of this is very, very simplified. So there's loops behind loops, within the loops, and all of that kind of stuff, I suspect. Um, also, 
it, it's kind of only one way going around, but it all depends, and you will find out as you're progressing. And I'm st starting to panic about time already. And then you form your hypothesis, and there's many different templates for this. This is something that we have put together based on various different places. You could do it in various different ways. Of what is the tension that you want to do something about? What do you propose to do? What do you think will result from you doing it? And how will you know you are successful? So I shared this with somebody, in fact, with our marketing agency that we have started working with the other day, and they were saying, what if we don't achieve that? So the answer is, they're called learning metrics for a reason, right? They're not there to say that we succeeded or not. They're there to help us learn, to help us learn and adjust. So that's your hypothesis. So what do we do then? Then we design an experiment or a number of experiments. And uh, this is a bit more elaborate. I keep on thinking this is too complicated because I took some stuff from uh, Mike's agenda shift, from um, Jochen Appello's book, from one or two other places, and I put it all together. I think I need to simplify it, but that's your hypothesis. And then around hypothesis, you have a few more things, maybe a bit more about context. What are you assuming? Um, what are the dependencies? What are the risks? That kind of stuff. What are the requirements? What do you need? Who needs to be involved? What you need by way of money, time, and crucial thing that is not there. Well, no, it is at the bottom, duration. How long do you want to run this? How long will you need to get some meaningful results that you can act on? Earliest possible um, meaningful and actionable feedback. When can you get that? So what then? You run the experiment and you get an outcome. So. Um, Somebody asked me, what's the difference between objective and outcome? And I, I don't know, I did some reading about it. And somebody somewhere said, objectives are what you would like to get. Outcomes are what you really get. I just called them uh, desired and actual outcomes. So you get the outcome, and then you compare it with what you thought you would get. Well, guess what? That's information. That's the feedback. So you get some more insight from there. What are you going to do next? So you document it. So what did you expect to happen? What actually happened? What's the difference? What have you learned? What would you like to do next? And you document that as well. You document it in the form of an insight. So again, at the core of it is your hypothesis, but then you write around it. OK? Can't even read what it says there. What have you learned? What are you going to do next? And then you go around the circle again, or you stop. Maybe you need to stop and go back and say, well, hang on. What was I thinking? What were we thinking? What have we learned about what we were aiming for? Are we still aiming for the right thing? Is the thing that we were aiming for still correct, useful? Or do we need to change direction? All based on real learning. OK. So reflect, reevaluate. How are we doing for time, sir? Perfect. I'm going to finish earlier. Yes, and we're still on how, but now it's the kind of nuts and bolts of how. This is not the process anymore. This now is about, well, what else do we need to think about? So I love quotes, as you will see on the last slide. So. Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. So, we need to find a balance between trying to um, try to attain certainty and remain flexible. So, another great woman, great writer called Nancy Klein, she talks about three addictions in our organizations: the addictions to control, urgency, and certainty. That's what we want. We're really uncomfortable when we don't know what's going to happen. Give us news, even that they're bad news. Just don't leave us hanging, right? So urgency, control, urgency, certainty. This is about control. We need to find the right balance between the control and flexibility. And then we need to do the change through people. 
not two people, which goes back to, again, what Cliff was saying when he was saying people resist change. People actually resist being changed. Again, Peter Senge said that. Okay, so let's look at these three. So prediction is very difficult. Um, I fairly recently read the book called The Midnight Library by Matt Haig, and this is the quote I picked up from the book. This is the problem with outcomes. You can choose choices, you can choose what you want to do. You can never choose the outcomes. The outcomes happen or, you, or they don't happen. You don't control outcomes, and that is the problem. You can't get a control, you can't get a certainty. You can only learn. So what does that mean? Um, the big, the, um, the metaphor of change as a big transformation project. I wrote something clever about transformation earlier and I completely forgot what it was. Um, I may remember. But the whole idea that the change happens, and this is how we used to work and this is how some organizations or big consultancies, some of them still work, is this is our current condition, current state. We know where we are. This is where we want to be, future, end state, target operating model. Let's, let's, let's do the plan. The whole paradigm is about predict and plan. And, and then follow the plan. And if it fails, it's the problem of execution. You did not execute well. You need more project managers. Okay? Unfortunately, that very, very rarely works. So here's a different way. Uh, I love the term present thinking or ideal present. So here's where we are. What's the ideal current condition? What's the next step on the way? Well, what is the ideal current condition? What do we need to do today that will deal with the present mess, that will prevent, help prevent future mess, and that will make the, the ideal future a bit more possible? What's that next step? So we try to make ne that next step, maybe we get here, then that becomes our current position. Then we do the same. So we move slowly, slowly in small steps. And guess what's going to happen? So if you don't know where you're going, you'll end up, you'll end up someplace else, else. Unfortunately, even if you do know where you're going, you probably end up someplace else. <laughs> the only difference is now you will know. And chances are you will have guided yourself through the learning and through the feedback learning and adaptation, you will have guided yourself to that other place, which is better, probably more suitable than what you originally anticipated. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. So that's the present thinking. Don't try to predict the future. It's not going to work. But you know that better than I do. Okay. Finding the balance between clarity and flexibility. So I'm going to share with you the product delivery roadmap because we need a product delivery roadmap. Everybody needs one, right? And again, I've stolen this from several places, combined it, um, and maybe it's going to come up. So let's say we have a big outcome. We have a mission. As a department, as an organization, as a division, we have a mission. We have a number of teams, and these are quarters maybe, or months, or whatever the right time period is for you. So now, when we're looking at the next month or next three months, these are the things that we want to accomplish. These are our outcomes. Each team has a clear outcome and all of those outcomes link back to the mission and support the mission. There's an alignment. I'm not going to talk about um, how that happens because that would be a bit too detailed for now. But for these outcomes, for the current period of time that we have committed to, we have defined the indicators of success, learning metrics, and we have an idea of what outputs we need to produce and what activities we need to do, what do we need to do to produce those uh, outputs. So activities make outputs, outputs hopefully enable and support outcomes. Maybe not, we will learn, but we have a plan and okay, that's how far in the, into the future we want to commit to. Next period of time we have planned for, we have an idea of out, outcomes we want per each team, and the outputs that we may want to produce to enable and support those outcomes, but we're not 100% sure. 
We're not going to the level of indicators of success, planning activities. We'll see when we get there, we'll get the feedback from this. We'll adjust. And then further out, we may come up with some ideal outcomes, but we'll leave it at that level. And I was talking about this, God knows, years ago to somebody, and they gave me this, whoops, they gave me this great analogy of uh, metaphor of ice, water, steam. So the current period of time is frozen. We have committed to it. If the fire breaks out, it's going to melt and things will change. But for the moment, it's pretty solid, right? Next period of time, I keep on pressing the wrong button, next period of time is still in flux. Things may change and probably will. Thereafter, it's all up in the air. Things will change. We have put some stakes in the sand, not even in the ground, because it's useful to know where we might be going, but that's all we need. And what will probably happen is that as you're going through this, you will start not even thinking about this. You'll think about this at a very, very high level because you will be getting feedback and adjusting. So that's the finding balance between the clarity and flexibility. And finally, change through people, not to people. And um, this sounds like an obvious phrase. I searched for it. I couldn't find it. I think one of my partners came up with it. I really like it. Um, I had a bunch of things here. I ended up only having three quotes. So the first quote is, change by invitation rather than by obligation from Jeff Combs from the Sociocracy 3.0, the novel. So stop imposing, invite people. I wanted to invite, my intent of this talk is to invite you to do more work around outcomes. I can't impose it on you, nor can anybody else. No, can you as Agile coaches in your organizations? Okay. Second one is David Marquette talking about moving the authority to information. And again, there's a whole bunch of things behind this. But to be able to move authority to information, you really need to have the clarity of the direction, which is what we're talking about, clarity of outcomes, plus the capability to deliver. Because otherwise, there's no point giving authority to people who have neither clarity nor capability. That's not going to end up particularly well. And finally, this is probably one of my favorite, if not the favorite quote of all time. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. So this is about caring about people. This is about, again, somebody said earlier today, ask people about what it is that demotivates them and then do something about it. Don't try to motivate them by table tennis tables and God knows what. What's stopping them do the work? There's a great interview between Bill Anderson, the CEO of Roche Pharmaceuticals, and Gary Hamill, the author of, most recently, Humanocracy, where, um, where they talk about this, where they kind of refer to this, um, and it's a well worth one to listen to. And finally, I want to finish with Banksy. And I, how, how long do we have? So can I first ask you to pick somebody up, turn to your neighbor, and talk about these three things, not necessarily just about this talk, but about the last two days. What have you learned? What are you going to learn or explore further? And most importantly, what are you going to do differently? Can we spend a couple of minutes on that? Who are you going to talk?
Is that enough? <laughs> Thank you. That was really useful for me because I remembered what I wanted to say on the last slide and then completely forgot. <laughs> so, so talking about caring about people and asking for what demotivates people, Bill Anderson tells a story of how he, when he became the CEO of Roche Pharmaceuticals. He did what every senior manager, every manager, every person in the organization, every coach that goes into an organization should do first. Go and talk to people. Ask questions and listen to them. And the people told him, we love this place. We love working here. We love the values. We love the ethos. We love what we're doing. We can't get anything done. So what's, so what's holding you back? And how can I help? Is what allegedly he asked. And that's what leadership is. It's providing direction. It is looking for what's holding people back and taking those things away. It's enabling, it's, it's kind of letting people fly. Thank you. <laughs>